coming up next on Passion Struck. With anxiety, we learn to worry, but with eating, this is where comfort food comes in. This is where the term stress eating comes in. If we eat some food, our brain says, hey, that tasted pretty good. Why don't you eat when you're stressed? And so we start to learn these habits of eating, not when we're hungry, but when we're stressed, when we're bored, when we're angry, or just simply when we see food, because it's like, oh, that looks good. Boom. We often lose the ability to really check in with ourselves to ask, am I actually hungry? That's what habit is all about is automatic behavior. The joke is about this I'm on a seafood diet. I see food and I eat it, that type of thing. Well, that's our survival brain that's been co-opted in modern times. Welcome to Passion Struck. Hi, I'm your host, John R. Miles. And on the show, we decipher the secrets, tips, and guidance of the world's most inspiring people and turn their wisdom into practical advice for you and those around you. Our mission is to help you unlock the power of intentionality so that you can become the best version of yourself. If you're new to the show, I offer advice and answer listener questions on Fridays. We have long form interviews the rest of the week with guests ranging from astronauts to authors, CEOs, creators, innovators, scientists, military leaders, visionaries, and athletes. Now, let's go out there and become passion struck. I am absolutely thrilled to welcome my friend, Dr. Judd Brewer, back to passion struck. Welcome back, Dr. Judd. Thanks for having me. So the last time you were on the show, we did an in-depth exploration of how to overcome anxiety, something that you're well known for. And in today's episode, we're going to discuss your brand new book, which I was one of the few privileged who got an advanced reader copy of. And it is absolutely awesome. And it's called The Hunger Habit. And in it, you explore why we eat when we're not hungry. Can you explain what prompted you to write about this? Well, it was not on purpose. Let's start there. <laughs> and I say that because <laughs> I was developing a smoking program as an addiction psychiatrist, was really struggling to help my patients quit smoking. And so I was looking at alternative ways to help and the, the willpower approach hadn't really worked for a lot of my patients. So we were developing this program called Craving to Quit and it's an app-based program. So I was having people pilot test it. And when they were pilot testing it, they were saying, oh yeah, I'm changing my eating habits. And I was thinking, well, most people gain weight when they quit smoking because they substitute eating for smoking. So I'd made an assumption that they were just substituting eating for smoking. But somewhere in there, somebody said, no, no, we're actually, I'm using these same tools to change my eating habits in a good way where I'm, I'm not snacking as much, for example, as I pulled my jaw back off the floor because, <laughs> you know, wait a minute, I almost missed something huge here. That actually got me looking into how eating has shifted from an evolutionary mechanism that helps us survive, that one's still in place. But in modern day to where we eat for all sorts of reasons, but none of them having to do with hunger. So we developed this Eat Right Now program. And long story short, as a researcher, as a neuroscientist, I want to understand how this stuff works. So we started studying it and learning all sorts of fascinating things. As you and I talked about at the beginning of the program, I'm going to offer myself up as a guinea pig today because... I think like many people who might be listening to this, I am someone who, although I look really fit today, I have had a lifelong struggle with my weight that started as long as I can possibly remember. It's interesting because you write in the book that the patients that you see as a psychiatrist are so helplessly out of touch with their bodies that they can't even tell if they're hungry or simply eating with their emotions. How prevalent do you think this is today? Oh, wow. It is so prevalent. And I'll just highlight, this is, I learned so much from my patients. I didn't realize how prevalent it was until I started working with a group of women who all had binge eating disorder. And I went in with the assumption that they could at least tell when they were hungry. And long story short, that assumption was completely wrong. I don't know a single person in that room. I'm just thinking back to them. I can't think of a single one that actually could tell the difference between what's now called homeostatic hunger, which is actual true physiologic hunger, and hedonic hunger, which is a term that's a misnomer. 
in one sense, but also the scientific term that we use to study this phenomenon because it is so common. And hedonic hunger just means that we're eating because of something that is emotional, like pleasant or unpleasant. That's what hedonic is all about. Yet it has nothing to do with actual hunger. So that's where it's a misnomer. Yeah, so it's like we're on the, the treadmill, but to eating all the time. Yes. So I am probably like most of the people out there that as I've seen dietitians or as I've gone to fitness programs, I remember doing the Orange Theory Challenge, which is one of the most recent one. Almost all of these things have been about people telling me that I needed to simply count the calories that I'm putting in and putting out, and that's going to make all the difference. Mm -hmm. But According to your research, that doesn't work. Yes. Now, to be clear, the formula is true. I learned it in medical school. Students still learn it in medical school, just calories out versus calories in. And the way I learned it in medical school is like it was a, a Newtonian law. Well, this is just what you do. And the, the lecturer just stated it as though it was fact. It is true. Yet they didn't say how you actually go about that. So if we look at all of these, and it's it generally tends to be some flavor of calories in, calories out, just with a new wrapper or a new label. It's like, oh, this year it's this diet. This year it's this diet. This year it's this diet. Yet all of them share some common element, which is just use your willpower and do it. When it comes to doing it, one of the things that keeps coming up on this podcast as a barrier to to maintaining our weight are the simple things of sugars and breads or starches and also processed foods. Mm -hmm. How much do you think those are playing really into the problem or is it really a behavior issue? I would say it's both. So to set the stage, we have, and let's start with those pieces, but then let's go to how our brains are set up because those two interact with each other. So in modern day, there's all of this engineering of food. I hesitate to call it food in some cases. <laughs> Do you remember the Onion, that satirical journal? They had a headline that says, Doritos celebrates its one millionth ingredient. So we get a sense for how engineered this stuff can be. And in fact, R.J. Reynolds merged with Nabisco at some point because their tobacco engineers could then shift their focus to food when, when the tobacco industry got in trouble in the 80s. So this has been around for a long time. There are entire books dedicated to how people engineer things like bliss points and vanishing caloric density, which is just a fancy term. If you think of a Cheetos or something that melts in your mouth, you put this thing in your mouth and your body says, oh, I just ate something. And then it's gone. And then did I just eat something? No, it's gone. I didn't even chew it. And, and so we'll try that again. <laughs> you know? And then suddenly a whole bag of these things that's designed to melt in our mouth is in our stomach. And so the calories are there. It's just that our brain has been fooled. So I won't go on and on because there are people that dedicate their lives that, to describe this, but you get a sense of it. There's the bliss point, this perfect marriage, let's say, of salt, sugar, and fat, et cetera. So that's the context in which we are living. Another contextual piece that's important is the ready availability of food. We, can, we have food delivery. We have 24-hour restaurants and diners that are open for people that have the privilege of being able to eat whenever they want, they can eat whenever they want. Because in the Western world, at least the food is there. Okay. So we've got ready availability of food and we've got engineering of food to make us want more. Somebody put it beautifully to me the other day. They said, they were talking about uh, some type of candy and they said, it tastes like more. <laughs> as in couldn't really describe the taste because their brain didn't have a good category for it but they knew that they wanted more when they ate one and that's certainly been the case i'm happy to talk about my addiction to gummy worms at some point if that's helpful i think we've all run into those types of things okay so we've got the taste like more and we've got the ready availability of taste like more. And also, I'll just add, most of these things have a shelf life of about a thousand years. So we can put them in our drawer, we can put them in our car, we can put them anywhere so that we have ready access to them. So that's the modern context. And we're going to pit that against our ancient brains. And our ancient brains were set up to help us survive with two main flavors. 
One is we've got to remember where food is because there isn't food delivery. <laughs> we had to go actually walk. <laughs> to the, couldn't even drive to get the food. We had to go walk somewhere and find it. And then we had to remember where it was. And this general flavor, I'll, I'll just go through it quickly. You know, I've talked about this before with, because the same mechanism is at play with anxiety. It's called positive reinforcement. Three elements, a trigger, a behavior, and a result. So let's say we're walking around on the savanna. We find the food, there's a trigger. We eat the food, there's the behavior. And then our stomach sends this dopamine signal to our brain that says, remember what you ate and where you found it. So it's that set up as the, the place marker that says, hey, here's the food. When you come back tomorrow, this is where you'll find it. The negative reinforcement flavor of that works the same way. It's just that it helps us avoid things that are unpleasant. So if there's danger and we see that there's some a bunch of tigers over at this certain food source, we can remember, hey, let's avoid that. There's the behavior. And then our reward is that we survive. We don't become their lunch. So that's our ancient brain. Okay. Now, when you bring these two together, let me just highlight that the ancient brain is set up to help us get calories when we need them. And it also has this mechanism to pack on calories in case we can't find food for a while. So we, when there's something that's a high calorie source, our brain says, okay, pack it in. And then so with, with sugar, for example, that's a really good source of calories. We'll take sugar in and then we'll store it as fat. And the idea is that's going to help us survive. And in fact, in not even super ancient times, being fat was actually a sign of prosperity, right? Because you're going to be more likely to survive a famine over somebody that's skinny. So that's the lay of the land. Now let's bring these together. This positive and negative reinforcement process that is very much at play in everyday life, this is how things like anxiety get set up because something unpleasant happens. Let's say that we get anxious or stressed. And so with anxiety, we learn to worry, but with eating, this is where comfort food comes in. This is where the term stress eating comes in. If we eat some food, our brain says, hey, that tasted pretty good. Why don't you eat when you're stressed? And so we start to learn these habits of eating, not when we're hungry, but when we're stressed, when we're bored, when we're angry, or just simply when we see food, because it's like, oh, that looks good. Boom. We, and we eat it. We're not even thinking about, oh, I'm hungry. We often lose the ability to really check in with ourselves to ask, am I actually hungry? That's what habit is all about is automatic behavior. The joke is about the seafood. I'm on a seafood diet. I see food and I eat it, that type of thing. Well, that's our survival brain that's been co-opted in modern times. Yeah, it's a really interesting discussion because what you're really talking about is that the traditional approaches of willpower measuring self-control that we hear all the time are not how we're going to address the issue. It's mm -hmm. instead to get rid of these unhelpful habits. And you're right, uh, through centuries, we were hunter-gatherers and that's how our metabolism was created. And now we have so much readily available to us that we don't fall into that pattern anymore. It's something for me that's worked, I think, to counteract this is I've been doing intermittent fasting now for mm -hmm. about seven years. And but it's interesting because I am in a couple group of friends where we like to go cycling and they like to cycle for about 10 miles, stop and get breakfast and then cycle back, which I don't understand the reasoning behind it because me I don't want to cycle with food in my belly, but I've been sitting there for years now as they eat, having a cup of coffee or a glass of water. And they're like, aren't you hungry? Doesn't it drive you crazy watching us eat? And I'm like, no, I'm actually not hungry. So yeah. I don't yeah. break the fast until I feel hunger. Right. And I'm still hunting and I gathering. It. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but it's interesting because except for one of them, the rest of them have these unhealthy eating habits and probably eat too much, which we fall into. So can you maybe take us down another scientific element of this on explaining the process of how food habits are actually formed in our brains? I'd be happy to. And so if we look at this survival mechanism, the healthy habits are the ones where we're in touch with our physiology and we've learned basically all we need to learn is what food is going to give us calories and what food is going to kill us. Right? So we have a very good mechanism 
for detecting rotten or poison pretty quickly. I'll just geek out on this a little bit because I love this, how this works. <laughs> so let's say that we eat some chocolate or some berries or something like that. And so if you think about eating chocolate, you, if you're really paying attention, you just let it melt in your mouth and you taste it and you're like, this. there's this note and this note. And then let's say that we eat some food that is rotten. That is ejected from our mouth before we're even consciously aware of it. And then our consciousness comes online and it's like, that was rotten. And so notice the, just the time scale of that, where it's, what's the one that, uh, is it cyanide or arsenic that tastes, maybe it's arsenic that tastes like almonds or something. So it's like, oh yeah, cyanide does taste like almond. Wow. That's so interesting. That's out <laughs> of our mouth because of its very bitter flavor that says, hey, don't be ingesting this. We don't have time to even think about it. So I just love how exquisitely evolved or designed our brains are to be able to detect all of these things to help us survive. That mechanism is at play. And then, so that's the healthy habit, right? The other part of the healthy habit is that when we pay attention, when we eat, we stop when we're full because our stomach and our body tells us, hey, that's enough. Okay. The unhealthy aspect of things are when we start to lose connection with our bodies. So whether it was a clean plate club that we learned as a kid, so eat all the food on your plate before you get dessert. Our parents were unknowingly actually training us to overeat. Uh, and the reward was that we'd get dessert where we got to eat even more. <laughs> it's like everything on your plate before you get this treat. So we've learned to overcome our natural body signals so that we are eating beyond satiety. We're eating beyond fullness. And we're also eating in the absence of hunger. So we go to the movie and it's not like our parents when we're kids, it's not like our parents were saying, okay, don't eat anything because we're going to go fill up on popcorn <laughs> you know, at the movie theater. <laughs> They're like, most of us didn't go to the movie theater with an empty stomach. So we go to the movie theater and we learn to associate like the butter and the salt and the, the flavor of popcorn with a good time because we're at the movie theater. It was a big treat for me to go to the movie theater. And I still remember they ask you, how many squirts of butter do you want on your popcorn? And they'd go squirt, squirt as they turned the tub around. <laughs> <laughs> and as well, how much it, it, popcorn was more like a butter delivery vehicle than anything else at that point. And so I have certainly learned to associate the smell of popcorn, like movie theater popcorn with like really good times because I got to see some amazing movies as a kid in the movie theater. It was a big treat. There's no such thing as like a 4K big screen television. <laughs> it was amazing. So we start to drift from the survival mechanisms to, hey, this is good times, whether it's the movie theater popcorn or whatever. And then that drift happens even more when we learn to associate eating with the alleviation of unpleasant things. So we learn, hey, when you're stressed out, when you're bored, when you're angry, when you're mad, when you're sad, whatever the emotion is, we learn to associate that with eating as well. Again, none of these have to do with actual hunger. So that's how the habit gets set up. As an example, you feel stressed, there's a trigger, you eat some chocolate or some ice cream, it tastes good, so you distract yourself, you might feel a little bit better for a moment, and then the result is you don't feel as bad. And that's the simple mechanism that gets set up and over and over and over and over to the point where it's automatic. We're stressed, we're running, we're, we're headed to the refrigerator and we're not even aware of it. So it sounds like what you're talking about is our eating habits are just like any habits that we have. It would be just as bad as you arsoning the very aspirations that you have by continuing to do harmful habits that are keeping you from your goals. So yes. I think what you're saying is that if you want to break these eating habits, and I know you don't like to call habits bad, but if you want to break eating habits, it requires that you use awareness is what I think you're saying and not willpower, which is what so many of us have been taught to do. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. As a clinician, I'd been struggling helping my patients with smoking, eating anxiety. As a neuroscientist, this fascinated me because I was thinking, what lecture did I miss in medical school? What did I sleep through? Because I, for whatever reason. And so I started looking at the question from a neuroscience standpoint, and I was blown away because there are these very clear and equations that have stood the test of time for decades now. They're, for example, back in the 70s, these two researchers named Rascorla and Wagner came up with a reinforcement learning formula, which basically describes habit formation to a T. 
And it also describes how to change habits. And this equation has nothing to do with willpower. Absolutely, there's no variable in there for willpower. Neuroscientists don't even talk about it. The closest they come to willpower is talking about cognitive control. And when you look at these formulae, it's really about awareness. And what I mean, let's use a concrete example and then tell me if this fits with your experience. So again, our brains are set up to help us learn and they're also set up to help us learn habits so that we can set a habit today and then open up the space to learn something new. I think of it as set and forget. Habits are there to be automatic so that we don't have to relearn everything every day because our, our brains just don't have the energy and capacity and the time for it. So we set up an eating habit. Let's say, well, for me, chocolate cake. I have a certain reward value set up in my brain for chocolate cake. And there are different types of chocolate cake. There's the flourless tort that's really, it's basically like a chocolate bar. You can think of all the different types of chocolate cake. And so I've got a reward hierarchy in my brain for which types of chocolate cake I like the most and which I like the least. Like the chocolate cake from a box where you just add water and an egg and mix it and cook it low on my list. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. If a new bakery opens up in my neighborhood and I see that they've got some chocolate cake that looks pretty good in their window, I go into the bakery. I have no idea how good it is. So I buy some cake, I eat it. And if it's like the best chocolate cake I've ever had, my brain sets off this dopamine fireworks show where it says, boom, big dopamine spritz. And I remember, hey, this is a good bakery. These folks know what they're doing. It's called a positive prediction error from a neuroscience perspective. And that just means that my brain was expecting it to be this good, right? Because I've got a an idea of how much chocolate cake should be good. And it was, it beat the expectation. On the other hand, if I eat the cake, I'm like, meh, these guys got have some work to do. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I also get a dopamine spritz because I learned this, hey, not so good. And that's called a negative prediction error, meaning that it was worse than expected. Notice how both of those cause dopamine firing my brain. And in both scenarios, I learned this one's good, this one's bad. This one I prefer and this one I per don't prefer. Like you said, I, good and bad are just ways that we judge the world. And so I think of it as our survival brains are out there trying to say, hey, this is helpful for survival and this is not helpful for survival. And it helps us not just label things as good and bad. And then we're really good at judging things anyway. So let's not judge ourselves for our habits. You know? Okay. So notice how that only requires one thing, which is awareness. So if you pay attention as you eat, your wise brain and body are going to tell you everything that you need to know. Now that might sound overly simplistic and I'm not saying it's as easy but from a neuroscience standpoint, this is critical. We have to know how our brains work. If we don't know how our brains work, we're not going to be able to work with them. And just as one example, we did a study. So we developed this Eat Right Now program and done a, there are several studies on this now, which is a part of the foundation of the book. We asked this simple question, like how quickly does somebody's reward value change in their brain, in their experience? And... We basically, what we did was we had people, we dealt what we call a craving tool. When they're craving a food, like an amount or a type of food, we had them basically pay attention as they ate the type or the amount of food that they were craving. And then we could measure how quickly that reward value changed. So ready for this? It only took 10 to 15 times of somebody overeating for that reward value to drop below zero. So for people who habitually overeat, all they had to do was pay attention. As they paid attention, their wise body told them, hey, this is not so good. Are you sure you want to overeat? And it's not about thinking, because everybody knows that overeating is not healthy for them. But this was doing something different. Instead of thinking, they were feeling what it felt like. They were feeling the results. And that's exactly what these equations predict, that if you pay attention, the reward value changes and this can happen pretty quickly. Our brains are tremendously plastic in the sense that they can change, they can rewire, they can change synapse strength, they can change dendritic density, all these types of things with receptors on our axons and our dendrites where we can, we, that's how we learn, that's how we change behavior. And it makes sense. From an evolutionary perspective, we don't have time 
to be chased 20 times by the tiger to learn that it's dangerous. We have to learn things pretty quickly. And the critical ingredient there, again, is awareness. So, Judd, I just wanted to ask you that through a different lens. So I think one of the biggest issues I personally have, I think it started when I was at the Naval Academy, is I eat way too quick. When I was a plebe, what we end up doing is you're sitting there and you're having to, in a right angle, put the food in your mouth. And like every time it gets right to your mouth, the upperclassmen ask you a question. So you put it down and you get about two minutes to eat once they leave the table and you're just jamming as much as you can get in before you have to go to class. But it's set up this pattern for me that I eat, I think, way too quickly, especially as mm -hmm. I observe others. I'm sure this is something that maybe it happens to other people. How can you break that habit? Yes, it's very common. Here, I think once we understand how our brains work, we can learn to work with close to any context in which we're put. So, for example, you just may not have time to eat at a pace that allows your body to register how much you've eaten. And that time frame from the research suggests that it's 15 to 20 minutes to register uh, fullness, basically. In an ideal world, we'd eat slowly enough so that we could start to register. We give our bodies that time to say, hey, okay, you've had enough. And for any of us that have had time to do that, it's pretty straightforward, right? Our body says, okay, that's enough assuming that we're paying attention. In the situation where we don't have time, and I think that's a great example of one, we can actually use the, I call this in the book, we talk about retrospectives, where we look in the rearview mirror and we ask, okay, what and how much did I eat? And was that enough, not enough, or too much? And so if you had to run off, if you had to eat your food in two minutes and run off to class, 20 minutes later, as you're sitting in class, your stomach could tell you, hey, that wasn't enough. Hey, that was too much. Or hey, that was just right. We still have the ability to check in and then learn from it. We have to learn to associate, this is called reinforcement learning. We've got to learn to associate the behavior with the result. So again, that takes awareness, but that awareness can come in ret retrospectively as well. So do you think something like that would apply, if you'd known this, something like that could apply to your situation? Yeah, I think it would. And oftentimes, I think because I eat quickly, I don't allocate myself the time to eat slower, meaning I know how long it typically takes me to eat. So for me, a lunch break is probably shorter than some people because I know I'm going to consume the food faster. And I'm wondering if I just set a longer period for me to do it, if it would start changing my outlook on how quickly I'm consuming it. Yes. And so if not everybody has the opportunity to do that. So I just want to highlight a lot of people, they don't get a lot of time for lunch or sometimes they're not even given a lunch break. If you were able to allocate your a little bit more time, you'd see it doesn't mean that you have to take a two hour lunch break. <laughs> it can happen if we know how the process works. Probably 30 minutes is plenty to give ourselves time to consume. And also to wait to check to see, is that been, is that the right amount today? Because it also changes, right? If one day we're exercising more or didn't get a chance to work out or something like that, those caloric needs can vary from day to day. Well, what you and I have just been discussing is the beginning aspects of your book. And then in it, you go through a 21 day challenge, which you separate into three different parts of the book, days one to five, days six to 17, and then days 17 to 21. And I was hoping we could start by maybe having you introduce an overview of the 21 day challenge and what it aims to achieve. I'd be happy to. So this is really based on a lot of work we've done over the last decade in my lab, where we've done qualitative research and focus group interviews because we'd seen, so for example, in one study, this was led by Ashley Mason at UCSF, with our Eat Right Now program, there was a 40% reduction in craving-related eating. And we were seeing pretty good results. In fact, this Eat Right Now program is now a CDC-recognized diabetes prevention program, the first one that's really based pretty exclusively on mindfulness training and awareness. Certainly, it includes all of the required elements <laughs> for the DPP, but the Diabetes Prevention Program, for example, has for the last 
for decades, I think, has been largely based on willpower-based approaches. So it's really nice to see that the CDC is open, as long as there's research behind something and, and data to support it, that they're open to alternative curricula. So this, what we had done is some of our research behind this program was to just start asking people like, well, we're seeing that you're changing your eating habits. A lot of people were losing weight when they just by paying attention because they're like, oh, I don't need to eat as much. And there's the calories in calories out thing, but it's very different than saying I need to force myself to restrict, right? Because with that, our brains say, oh, is there a famine here? I need to hold on to calories which is, that's very different than saying, hey, do I need this much? And showing our brains and bodies, like we've got plenty there if we need it and we don't need to overconsume. So we'd done these focus groups and started asking these questions. And what we found that was that it breaks down to three pretty clear steps. The first step is just becoming aware of the habit loop or even breaking that down or simplifying it even more. What's the behavior? Am I eating because I'm hungry or because of some other hedonic reason, an emotion or boredom or whatever? Second step leverages what we've actually talked about in terms of the neuroscience, where it brings an awareness to help us ask ourselves, what am I getting from this? So we literally have people ask that question and we can go into that in detail in a minute, but that's the basic premise is we're giving, helping our brain get those positive and negative prediction errors which then helps us shift the behavior. We think of it this way. If it's an unhelpful habit, we become disenchanted with the behavior. The third step I call finding these bigger, better offers because we're again, leveraging the same reward-based learning system in our brain and we're giving our brains something better. So as an example, for me, I shifted from eating entire bags of gummy worms to eating blueberries because for me, blueberries just tasted better and then I felt better afterwards and they didn't taste like more. <laughs> and the last thing I'll say about the overview of the program is that I set it as a 21 day program because one of the biggest questions that I get that is based on an internet meme, as in a false statement on the internet is somebody asked me, how long does it take to break a bad habit or form a new habit? And if you put that into the internet, ask whatever your favorite search engine is, almost invariably it'll come up with, well, it takes about 21 days. And I do this as a tongue in cheek nod to where that meme comes from, which was a 1960s book written by a plastic surgeon who in a very unscientific way, just started noticing, observed that it took about three weeks for his patients to get used to their new nose jobs. So it's not to say, well, certainly we found in our research, 10 to 15 times of somebody paying attention as they overeat, that reward value drops below zero and they start to shift behavior. So this can happen pretty quickly, but it's not to say it's guaranteed if here's the thing, here's the formula and it's guaranteed to work. That just sets people up for failure. What I can say is this, is this is all based on our science and the guarantee there is that we all have awareness and that we all have very wise bodies that will tell us all that we need to know. The, none of that has to do with willpower. One of the first things that you talk about in the days one through five is effectively setting a baseline and a map of food habit loops. How does one go about approaching that? It's pretty simple. And again, not necessarily easy, but it's pretty simple. And just asking a basic question, like, why am I reaching for food? So I break it down a little bit more like the why, the what, and the how of eating. But it can start with why am I reaching for food? Am I actually hungry or not hungry? And that helps to identify the behavior. Is it automatic snacking? Is it stress eating? Is it overeating? Because I'm used to finishing everything on my plate. So just identifying the behavior is the first step. And then how do you help people to understand, to differentiate between genuine hunger and urges? That's a critical question. And this is one of the things that I discovered when I started working with my group of binge patients with binge eating disorder. And so the, the way that they described it was that they had an urge and they just ate. 
And I, I at first assumed that this was because of homeostatic hunger. Well, an urge, it can be a grumbling in our stomach. It can be a loss of concentration. It can be irritability. There are a number of things that tell us that we're actually hungry, have that homeostatic hunger. Yet, unfortunately, there's a large overlap between a number of these and, and hedonic hunger, where we're eating outside of hunger. And so, for example, if we can't concentrate on something or we're irritable, well, that could actually be true homeostatic hunger or it could be hedonic hunger because there are a number of other things that make us irritable. <laughs> and so we can see that there's overlap but that's, it's not complete overlap. And we can also add emphasis to different aspects of our experience based on how recently we've eaten. So if we just ate and we're irritable, well, that's probably not because we're hungry, right? And so we can start to bring these things together, asking simple questions like, hey, how recently have I eaten and what did I eat? Because if we eat a bunch of carbohydrates, that can give us that sugar rush and crash versus for me eating a good blend of, especially if it's like whole food based food where it's non-processed and especially with a fair amount of protein in it. I found that for me, protein helps me stay full much longer than if I eat something with a vanishing caloric density, for example. And so we can start to ask, okay, what's going on in my experience? And I even give a checklist of a bunch of different things in the book. And then we can pair that with how recently did I eat? And that starts to give us a sense for whether we're actually truly hungry or if we're just mad, sad, angry, lonely, tired, or bored. One of the things I love to talk about, Judd, on this podcast is the power of intentionality and that set intentionality that drives behavior change, which I call intentional behavior change. Mm -hmm. But it seems like what you're talking about here, and this gets into days six through 16, is that paying close attention or said otherwise, being intentional about your eating behaviors will allow you to interrupt the habit loops that you've put yourself into. Is that a good way to understand? Yes. And I think intentionality can be supported, bolstered, and fostered with awareness. And the reason I say that is that the strongest learning mechanisms in our brain are the ones around reinforcement learning. And knowing that we can leverage that. And for example, we can ask the question, well, why do I want to exercise? And we can say, well, some social media influencers said that it's a good idea or they look good. So we can base it on external things like, oh, I think I should exercise. This is where the shoulds come in that joke. We should all over ourselves, right? <laughs> I should exercise more. Or we can also ask this question, well, what was it like the last time I exercised? And that can help us draw on our own direct experience and our own direct learning. And for me, when I exercise, it feels pretty darn good afterwards, especially, and even during Like I love the active exercising. For a lot of people, they're like, well, I make it through it and then I feel better. So it really depends on the person and also the exercise. So ideally we find something that we really love to do and it, it fits with our lives and our circumstances. But I, let me ask you that question, like after a bike ride and even during a bike ride, how does it feel? Well, that's one of my favorite activities to do. So that's something that I look forward to doing. Sometimes it's painful while you're in the act of doing it. I'm not mm -hmm. going to lie there. Right, right. Afterwards, you feel great uh, because you've accomplished something that you put your mind to. But even more than that, I, for me, I get the anxiety out of my system. I like to get that sweat in. But there are days like today I did a, a 6 a.m. spin class and it sometimes is hard to get yourself motivated to do it. Oh, but yeah. once you push through, boy, does it set your day up better? Yeah. So notice how the setting your day up better is a great way to motivate you and provide that intentionality simply through your own direct experience, right? So you set yourself up. We call this and a woman that I highlight her story in, in The Hunger Habit describes it as setting up a, you develop a, a disenchantment database or data bank, she describes it, where you become disenchanted with unhelpful habits, but you can also deposit those gold coins in an enchantment data bank that says, wow, exercise feels pretty good. And that actually 
uh, it goes right into the third step, which is finding these bigger, better offers. So it, it could be if we're comparing not exercising to exercising, we can see how crummy we feel when we don't exercise. And then we can also compare that to how great we feel when we do exercise. Again, just takes awareness of and recollection, right? So we've got to be aware of how it feels afterwards, or we won't actually have that information or those data points. And then we also just have to recall it like, well, how did it feel the last time I did this? We can also do the same thing with food. For me, it was gummy worms. I started paying attention as I ate gummy worms and they literally taste like more, right? I have a craving for the next one before I've even finished chewing and swallowing the one that's in my mouth. They're overly sweet. They've got this weird feeling, mouthfeel that's just not natural, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't feel good, especially because I feel like I got to eat the whole bag because I'm just so addicted. So I became, I really just started paying attention and became disenchanted with that. We actually have some gummy things in our cupboard right now. Totally not interested. Like my wife doesn't even ask me anymore if I want something <laughs> because I'm just not interested. So there's that second step of just paying attention. And then the third step for me was finding the blueberries were that bigger, better offer. Mm, love blueberries, love blueberries. So food, exercise, even the way we interact with people, we can look to see if I'm short with somebody all the time, what's the result of that? If I bring kindness in, if I even just pause and notice some irritation or irritability or something like that and pause and bring some kindness to an interaction, how does that result in my connection with that person? So there are lots of ways that we can bring these principles forward and, and eating is a big part of our lives. So there are lots of ways that we can even use that as a way to start to learn how our brains work and then learn to work with our brains. Yeah, man, it is one of the biggest pleasures we have. And I don't realize how important it is to me until I have a head cold and I can't taste anything. Or once I had COVID, I think I went for six or seven weeks without being able to taste or smell anything, man, it was horrible. Yeah. The one thing it did teach me is I did lose a lot of weight because since I couldn't taste anything I was eating, I ate the healthiest things I could get my hands on. <laughs> but I also wasn't as hungry either mm -hmm. because you didn't smell the smells in the house and the other things that I think were triggers to make you want to consume something. Yes. So, yeah. So one of the things I often talk about on the show is the need for us to reconnect with our self-awareness. A lot of that is doing mind work. But one of the things that you talk about in the book is that we need to reconnect with our body. Mm -hmm. How do you suggest that people reconnect with their bodies to better understand their eating habits? Yes. And this is not a strictly modern phenomenon, though I think it's getting worse. The more we have Cornell West put, described phones, our smartphones, as these weapons of mass distraction. So we have all of these ways to distract ourselves from our direct experience. So for stress, we can grab some food to distract ourselves, or we can go to our phone to distract ourselves. And that every time we do that actually distances us from our own bodies and our own experience. I highlighted a, there's a quote from a, a short story from James Joyce back from over a hundred years ago, 1914, I think the story is called the painful case. And he described Mr. Duffy as living a short distance from his body. Right. So this is common, especially in modern times where we have the ability to distract ourselves from ourselves. So the way that we can start to reconnect, there are a number of different ways that we can do it. And I think of the main tool is through curiosity. And then there are a number of techniques that can help us use that tool. And for example, a common one that I talk about in the book is called the body scan, right? Where we just start to bring curiosity to physical sensations as we scan through our body, whether it's head to toe or toe to head. And what that can do is just help us start to awaken to all of these myriad of different sensations that our bodies have from all the time that we're not even aware of. And even if it's not hunger or something like that, that just helps us start to reconnect with our body to say, hey, you know, a lot of signals here. Maybe I can start listening to them again. So, Judd, one of the things I wanted to end on is you put yourself through this 21 day challenge. You follow the instructions. How, by doing so, does it help build trust in yourself and your relationship with food? Well, 
knowing how something works builds a huge amount of trust, right? So imagine, let's say we walk into a room that is completely dark and we're stumbling around, we're bumbling and we're bumping into things. We have no idea what those things are, right? That is a lot of uncertainty for our brains. Our brains don't like uncertainty. So imagine that in contrast to walking in the room and flipping on the light switch. And then you say, oh, there's this. Here's how I, I don't bump into things. I think that's a decent analogy for how we interact with ourselves and our own brains. If we don't know how our brains work, and I'm not saying that we've got to know it down to every system and synapse, but I'm saying in a at a behavioral level, if we don't know how our brains learn, and if we don't know how they work to form habits, there's no way we're going to be able to work with them. That's that's a dark room and we're just going to be bumbling around. And we're going to be making a lot of false associations where we think we try something and it works for a little while and then it stops working and we wonder why it stops working. Well, it's probably because we've associated it with working in a correlational manner as compared to a causal manner. Correlation does not equal causation. So here, once we learn how our brains work, it helps us develop, just gives us some ease because we know the system. And I think of that as that first step in developing trust or faith. The next step is really critical, which is having our own experience. So we can say, okay, I learned that this theory, I've got to try it out myself. And so as people start playing with these practices themselves and they start simple questions like, well, what's it when I eat? Can I actually start to pay attention with each bite and see if that pleasure plateau effect is true? They can read my studies, but that's not going to be as faith or trust building as somebody's own experience. And so here we all have to do this ourselves and see for ourselves that every time we do this, every time we overeat, it feels like this. Every time I eat gummy worms, well, it's been a while, but... I can still recall the last time. <laughs> every time I ate gummy worms, it was like this. Whereas every time I, I eat blueberries, it's like this. And so that ongoing experience just builds our trust because we see that this is a consistent thing. Our brains love consistency, right? This is a consistent thing. It's not magic. It's not some fad diet. It's awareness. It's curiosity. And it's also the kindness we bring to ourselves because we're truly caring for ourselves as compared to just scratching that itch of indulgence. I think of it as meeting our needs as compared to feeding our wants, which is feeding our wants is all about automatic habitual behavior. Meeting our needs is really bringing that awareness in and asking, what do I need right now? And then looking at the results of how we meet that need. Thank you for being here today and congratulations again on The Hunger Habit. I highly encourage the audience to pick up a copy of this book. We've just gone through a small aspect of the jewels that are throughout it. And I always like to give the guest an opportunity to share where's the best place for listeners to learn more about you. Oh, sure. So I have a website, drjud.com, drjud.com, that has links to the books and a bunch of free resources and to our apps as well, if folks are interested in checking in those things out. I'm also on Instagram at dr.jud, at Dr. Judd. Yeah, thank you so much again for coming on the show. It's always such an honor to have you. It's really been my pleasure. I thoroughly enjoyed that interview with Dr. Judson Brewer, and I wanted to thank Judd and Portfolio for the honor of having him appear on today's show. You're about to hear a preview of the Passion Struck podcast interview that I did with Robert Sutton, a distinguished Stanford professor and best-selling author. Bob is recognized as one of the 10 B-School All-Stars by Business Week, and his influence extends far beyond the academic realm, reshaping contemporary business thinking. In this episode, we dive into his revolutionary new book, The Friction Project, which is about the friction that we all know exists in every single organization. Our discussion guides listeners on how to become adept friction fixers, enhancing workplace efficiency without exasperating the problems. There's this notion that sometimes there is good friction because it forces you to slow down and think. And other times there's bad friction where you just drive people crazy who are just trying to accomplish something simple they just want to get done. So our book is about how to tell the difference between the two. And once you figure out whether you want more or less friction, how you deal with that challenge. The fee for this show is that you share it when you find something useful or interesting. If you know someone who's struggling with their eating habits, then definitely share this episode with Dr. Judd with them. In the meantime, do your best to apply what you hear on the show so that you can live what you listen. Until next time, go out there and become passion struck. Mm -hmm.